history, but that is a piece to it as with everything. So, um, yeah, thanks for being here today. Uh, and uh, let me fix the screen here. Okay. So, yeah, my name is Eric Pinto. I'm a, the assistant director at the Catherine and Booter Center for American Indian Studies at Wash U. Um, the Fooder program, uh, we're a social work program within the Brown School of Social Work. So I do like student recruiting. So I'll go out and help like uh, share our uh, scholarship information to Native students from all across the United States to see if they want to pursue a master's in social work. And then, yeah, then they just come to, you know, apply to Wash U, see if they want to, you know, go ahead and hop into the program. And then from there on, you know, they go back home or their communities and, you know, help their people out. Uh, and the Catherine Booter Center was created back in 1990 by Catherine Booter, and she just had a deep passion for supporting Native people who want to get a master's in social work. But other than that, we're also involved in so much more like uh, like events, like the we have the Washi Pow that happens every year. I don't know if anyone's attended that. We don't have the date set yet, but it's every April. So I think we're trying to project for April 7th of this of 24. So uh, other projects and events, um, we have like the Hunt Fish Gather. Uh, that one will be, we have a public event at St. Louis Zoo on November 9th. And we're, we're doing a chef demonstration. We usually bring in a chef from, uh, you know, different tribes every year. And they kind of highlight, you know, their foods or I don't know, they put their own twist on it. But it's all kind of like native themes. So like last year we had uh, Chef Nephi Craig, who's white mountain Apache. Um, but he didn't do like so much of like his cultural foods. It was more so we looked at what would have been the foods that would have been hunted, fished, and gathered in this region here. So we really looked at Cahokia Mounds um, and seeing what those people would utilize. And, um, and also like too, if you're interested, like there's a book out there. If you, if you like history and foods and stuff, this book here by Dr. Gail Fritz, Feeding Cahokia, um, tells you a lot about uh, the, the foods that were um, eaten there, but also too, like cultivation, um, domestication of plants, um, all in this very, very well done book. Yeah, so today, um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about Native history. I think that's always a key point and people are very interested in that. I think some of you have attended maybe my other presentation, maybe not, um, where I talked about Missouri's Native history. So I'll touch on that. Uh, cultural connections to the land because we just don't view food as just being food and sustenance and keeping us going. It goes beyond that, there's a relationship there. And then, yeah, and then I'll talk specifically more about native foods. And I apologize, maybe some of the slides, uh, I think I got here today, some of the slides got a little thrown off. Uh, so things do look a little crammed. Um, I'll read the land acknowledgement uh, that the Booter Center came up with. So this is something uh, a lot of organizations, um, companies are starting to do now just because it holds accountability for uh, developing relationships with tribes. I think it's not only identifying the, the, the tribes who have connections to this land, but it's also sharing like how can these companies, organizations like help out Native nations and people. Um, so it goes beyond just acknowledging just the his history side of things. And if you or like, you know, you have your own business or you work for an organization that wants to get in this, you can always reach out to the Booter Center. We will be more than happy to help you out. So it reads the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis occupies ancestral, traditional, contemporary lands of the Osage Nation, Missouri, Illinois Confederacy, and many other tribes as the custodians of the land we where we reside, occupy and call home. We recognize their sovereignty was never ceded after unjust remo removal and encourage your own research on tribal removal, tribal sovereignty, and the history of the land you reside. We promote the inclusion of tribal history and the incorporation of contemporary thoughts and actions into your work. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm and support tribal sovereignty, history, and experiences by elders past, present, and seven, seven generations yet to come through the continued con connection to this land. So like I said, in within that statement, it holds like accountability to continuing to work with native people and communities. Yeah, uh, and as we go forward too, you know, there's a lot of uh, terms that are out there referring to native people. So I will say it can be, uh, a, I think a community um, preference. It could be an individual preference was kind of being thrown out there. I tell you indigenous, uh, very, you hear that a lot, but that's more of a broad pan term. So when you hear indigenous, it doesn't always mean like you're referring to like native people. Um, you can have indigenous folks from all across the world. Um, there's native, Native American, um, American Indian, Indian. Um, so I'll tell you that 
uh, some folks, I'll say individuals might have conflict with maybe Native American because they don't like, hey, American, you know, American, that's like post like colonialism, you know, uh, so maybe some folks just like the term Native. Uh, when it comes to we're Indian, you know, a lot of our relatives and, you know, uh, and within our own communities, we see, we say Indian a lot. But for me, it's like, you know, one of my best buddies, he's actually Indian from India. So it's like, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, so I'll, I'll use the term like Native or Native American, preferably for me. Um, so, but, you know, I got my dad or my aunt, like, they'll say like Indian still. Uh, First Nations might hear that more so with uh, up in Canada. Um, and then the tribal names. And the, the interesting thing is, is that with tribal names, like the names of the tribes, is that sometimes there's multiple names for the tribes. So you might have, you know, like I put on here. So um, I'm connected to the Mississippi's band of Choctaw Indians and uh, Zuni tribes. So like Zuni, that's the people don't call themselves Zuni, they call them Ashwi. Um, so that's actually the, what they call themselves. And I think Zuni is, it, it came from the Spanish. So it, when we talk about these terms and names and things, like it's kind of good to kind of do your own research and be more aware of that too. Yeah. Uh, ancestral homelands, so you see this map here. Um, uh, this would be post-colonialism, um, so, I mean, pre-contact. And so uh, you can see all the territories of tribes. Um, the different colors can kind of represent also the associate, the connections of like similar tribes, uh, kind of like sister bro brother type tribes. You know, uh, like you say, the Degia tribes, so like the Osage, Ponca, Omaha, Kaw, Quapaw, like they're all connected um, uh, tribes. Like they all, their languages are very similar to each other and their cultural practices are very similar. Yeah, and we look closely at Missouri. So as mentioned into the land acknowledgement, you know, these are some of the, like, the, you can see the general territories of some of the tribes that um, have connections to this land too. But these territories, it's not like they're set in stone over time, you know, there's over time, you're going to have changes in where uh, people are, you know, um, you know, moving to, or maybe territory to expand, you know, maybe some people like they face hardships like sickness or something or warfare. And so then they lose territory and the other tribes maybe take over the territory and things. So things do change. These It's not like these are sent stone, but it kind of gives you an idea about where these tribes have connections to uh, with the lands in St. Louis and Missouri. Um, today, there's actually a lot of work. You'll see projects being done with uh, the Osage Nation in St. Louis. And it's very interesting. Read the, if you read the origins of the Osage, uh, it's a very interesting story because they'll say like their people are connected to, you know, uh, Cahokia. Um, so that's why they're wanting to do a lot of work and preservation uh, here in St. Louis and Missouri. Yeah. And then uh, the map on the far left hand side, you can see that that's where actually a lot of the tribes um, that had connections to Missouri, um, they got pushed more westward or even, you know, more north into Iowa, um, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, and, and such. But you can see, you know, now look how small their territories are. So you obviously had federal and state policies that happened. So especially like the Indian Removal Act of 1830 um, that forced many tribes to start moving into reservation lands. But also, too, even within the state of Missouri, you see this passage up here in the upper right hand corner. So that was a statute passed. Um, in 1839, went all the way to about 1909, and uh, that prevented Native people basically from returning into the state. Uh, Native people had to receive permission from a governor, uh, an agent, um, to, in order to even just travel in back into the state. They could live in the state, so um, it, things like that happened in history, and it kind of makes sense why why you don't, don't see reservations in in Missouri, and why you know Missouri doesn't have very high populations of Native people in the state. Yeah. And so, yeah, this is a larger map. You can see like the current homelands. Like, so we thought that very first map I showed you where you saw the, the different colors all over the United States. And now you kind of drop down to these very smaller reservations. So we only make up 2% of the population. So, you know, when we look at the census data, you'll have like, you know, solely like basically Native American alone. Um, and then you'll have people who are also in combination like myself. So my mom, she's European mix. So all my native heritage on my dad's side. So I'm in that in combination of. Um, you might have you might see more of a higher population in census data, data with with that. Um, and there's 574 federally recognized tribes. So that's federally. There's also state recognized, and then there's even tribes that aren't even recognized. Um, with federally recognized tribes, uh, um, the the tribes create the constitution um, that has to get approved through the federal government, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. 
um, and they can receive benefits such as like healthcare through Indian health services, uh, support for like education, uh, you know, social work, like all kinds of various programs that help out their people. And this is, these were things that were built in the trees. So, and these nations here, they are legit nations within a nation. So you'll see jurisdictional differences between if you go onto the reservation, there might be different laws or how things are handled versus what's happening like, you know, out here. So, um, and you'll see conflicts of that with, you know, you see that with uh, in Oklahoma a lot. Um, you know, you see crimes and issues that might happen on a reservation, but if it's a non-native person, it, it, there's a whole fiasco about it. So there's podcasts, um, I think it's called like Land Back that talks about issues like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, and then, yeah, majority of actually Native people don't live on reservations, even though, like, we always tend to talk about, like, Native people and being on, in this relation of, like, being on the res, like, actually, there's a higher population of Native people actually off reservations. Uh, you could say, like, actually, one piece of that would, would have been the uh, urban re relocation program in, in, from the 1950s. So, actually, that's how my grandparents met here in St. Louis. So, Grandma, she's Choctaw from Mississippi. Grandpa is Zuni from New Mexico. In the 1950s, they uh, were part of the program. The program emphasized job opportunities, um, you know, better life and stuff. The thing was, the underlying uh, um, component to it was that it was about getting the people away from their community. So it makes it more challenging, actually, to kind of pass on your, you know, traditions, cultural knowledge, all that type of stuff. Uh, but they did meet up here in St. Louis, alone, had a family. I'd say that the federal government uh, succeeded in that because my parent, my dad, he didn't learn the language. Um, I don't know language. So like I'm trying to go back and learn all this stuff. So I don't know all the ins and outs of, you know, the tribes I'm connected to. I'm still learning. But these are like some of the things that have happened over time. Yeah. And so, yeah. And throughout American history, you can kind of say like, and Native people that kind of dealt with their own, we dealt with our own Holocaust, basically, um, you know, ever since colonization, you know, we look at the things that Columbus has done, you know, uh, you know, everything from slavery to killings, to uh, abuse, all kinds of different things. It seemed like from that point on, that's where like things just really picked off with, with this unfortunate Holocaust that our people faced. Uh, even the views, viewpoints too, and this kind of goes in, this will be connected to, you know, our way of life, uh, but we've always been viewed as like kind of being primitive savages, like our way of life is very primitive, basic and stuff, which is interesting because today now you got a lot of, you know, people, organizations, groups, land management companies and stuff, they're now we're referring back to indigenous people like, yeah, we should actually listen to them. Um, yeah, and then you know, throughout history too, there's always been this effort to basically just eliminate Native people. That's what I'm saying, like there, we face like a Holocaust and that's been seen through numerous different efforts. Um, you, you hear that with like, you know, you know, infamous, like, you know, I don't like to say infamous, but uh, massacres, battles, things like that. Unfortunately, you hear like, you know, the cavalry comes in and, you know, massacres, you know, Native people and, you know, things like that in like, you know, scalping and, you know, those bounties were, you know, like 10 cents for a scalp or something like that, you know, um, just a lot of unfortunate things. Uh, so you had uh, the elimination of people themselves, but they also had cultural genocide, which is the elimination of like our culture, traditional ways of knowledge, uh, seen as in through like, you know, a lot of people are familiar with like the boarding schools now, but that's getting a lot of attention. Um, you know, obviously the things of like um, um, the messages of manifest destiny, you know, that's why if you look, it's interesting when you kind of compare tribes, some tribes, it's like they did really well at retaining like, you know, their, their traditional beliefs. And then there's other ones such as like, you know, I'd say in Choctaw, um, you know, when I look at them versus the Zuni, the Zuni have, have retained a lot of their traditional cultural ways a lot better, a lot more, um, because they were able to isolate themselves uh, um, from the Spaniards. Versus what the Choctaw were able to do. The Choctaw were assimilated to dominant Euro-American culture um, more, more, more quickly. So when it comes to like learning like the traditional beliefs and stuff, it's not as strong. Like there's going to be individuals, yeah, that know that, but you know, predominantly they they believe in like you know, you know, a lot of the Christian beliefs and and, and that type of system. So um, yeah, it's it's just it varies tribe to tribe really with some some of those things. Uh, and then obviously, yeah, removal from uh, the homelands. You got things like the impact 
of what it has to, you know, when you think about when you move as a person um, from one, one place to another, you know, you're adjusting yourself. Think about when back in that time frame, you know, you have to, you're uprooted and some, some of these, you know, movements, you were literally forced by soldiers. Like you think of like the trail of tears. Think about you live in Georgia and you live on the land, like everything is all there ready. You know, all the natural resources you have, you know, your gardens, like, you know, things like that. It's all set. And all of a sudden soldiers come and say, Hey, no, you got to go to Oklahoma and you got to pick up your stuff. We got to move within the day and you start walking, tracking. And then after all the travels that you did, because they don't have access to the nice cars and trains that we do, um, and then they get placed into a new land, you got to get yourself situated and everything. So think about like all the stress factors that kind of add up and can affect someone's health. Um, and a lot of that builds up into like you, you hear about like, uh, um, uh, um, why am I blanking on it? Uh, generational trauma, historical trauma. Yeah. Uh, all those different various stressors can affect our health and well-being. Why do you think you hear about Native people being having higher rates of like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, cardiovascular disease? You know, it's it's not just like lifestyle. Like lifestyle is a factor of how an individual does live their life, uh, but also too, it's just all the other things that happen, you know, to their ancestors prior to that. Uh, and then so now, yeah, I'm going to talk more about connections to the land. Um, so Native people have always had this deep connection to the land. Um, we believe that everything is in relationship. Everything is interconnected with one another. Uh, we're not higher than the environment. We're not above plants and animals. Um, and I'll talk more about in, in depth of that. Um, and everything, we know that, hey, the environment um, has its own health and well-being, and that's being tended to, then that's going to keep us in better balance with our own health and mind and well-being. So when we look at well-being, we oftentimes examine like our physical, mental, social, spiritual well-being. Um, and those are all connected once again to the environment. You listen to our traditional knowledge and, and beliefs and things, it's all connected, it's tied, okay? Um, so many stories, it's, it's, it, it's tied to plants, animals, uh, the land, the sky, the water, all these different things, okay? Yeah, and we don't view ourselves as being like landowners, like, you know, like, you know, you hear a lot of people like, I own property in, you know, in this, in, uh, in Pacific Missouri or something, right? Um, but Native people, like, we don't say like, you know, we might say that this is our territory, but we don't say that this is like my land, you know? Um, so you got to kind of change, you have to kind of change the perceptions of how we kind of think, think of things too. We're stewards, we're taking care of the land. And this goes into what's called the four R's. Um, so like I said, relationship. Uh, we're in constant relationship all around us. You know, when we think about relationship, oftentimes we just think about like, you know, in relationships with, you know, people, maybe our pets, things like that. But honestly, you should actually think about the relationships with everything around you in your environment. Uh, you know, you think about the relationship, like even you can kind of think like, it doesn't have to be living things. It could be non-living things. Like think about like your home, like you want to take good care of your home and everything. Uh, the plants around your home, like your own garden or, you know, you have trees or bushes, things like that. You want to tend to that, right? And then think about what goes on beyond that, too. Um, so relationship go, it should go beyond what just what we see between people and, and, and maybe like our pets and, and those types of things. Uh, responsibility. We have the responsibility to take care of all our relatives. So when we look at environmentalism all together, you know, think about we got to take care of like all the water. We got to take care of the air everything else, because that's going to support us, which brings us into reciprocity. Everything, once again, is interconnected. Um, if something's out of whack in one thing, you know, that's going to affect our balance in another way. So let's say like, hey, let's say here our water source, like in, uh, let's say where we get our water from here in St. Louis, let's say it gets contaminated, right? Well, what are we going to do? And how can, if we've been drinking that contaminated water for so long, how, how may have that affected our, our health? So we got to make sure that we're keeping an eye on those types of things too, um, to make sure everything is staying in balance. And then redistribution, making sure that we're not just taking uh, resources all the time. Uh, we see that and what are the impacts of it? So such as like mining um, or like har harvesting like a lot of the uh, natural resources like oil, gas, um, uh, minerals such as copper, things like that. 
uh, that's real big, especially down in the Southwest region right now. Like you hear a lot about mining and look like co copper. Um, but the problem is, is like, what is that doing to the land and the water? And you hear so many reports of like, you know, uh, uh, you have the, the, the remaining waste materials that uh, contaminates the water. And then you know how water, it's all connected. You know, you get creeks and streams that dump into rivers. And then people are getting their water source, you know, from those systems. So, and it's going to affect their health. So we have to make sure that, you know, what are the impacts when we are taking? We've got to make sure that we're, we're, we're giving back to you. Um, if we think about like trees, for instance, I think that's a big easy one uh, for redistribution. Uh, if we're taking trees for, you know, paper sort, you know, paper, our utilization for paper, we got to make sure that we're planting trees, you know. Um, for instance, I did too, like uh, when I went out and I harvested, for those of you who tried the spice bush tea, when I went out and harvested that, I made sure like I, there's berries there and I would kind of chew on the berries, you know, give me like a little snack, a little boost. Uh, but also too, I, I spread those seeds out. To make sure that those seeds are going to plant more other plants, um, hopefully. So um, we got to make sure that there's that balance of you know giving and not so much taking. Yeah. So this kind of once again, these are examples of like you know I talked about the mining. So that middle picture kind of shows you um, an example of like what mining can kind of do to our water sources. Uh, Dapple, uh, you know, you heard the environmental impacts of that, how it's affecting native people up north. Um, because a lot of those pipelines, they have, there's always leaks at some point, right? So how, and they knew that the, those pipes were going to bust and, and leak and, and get into the, contaminate their water source. And the native people were like, hey, this is going to happen eventually. It doesn't matter. And that's, you have all these different examples. And um, we have a uh, land stewardship, you know, uh, a lot of efforts going on right now with how do we uh, better manage the lands to prevent these, all these like, catastrophic wildfires, you know, we got to have a better balance with that. So a lot of these, you know, land management companies now are, are falling back on indigenous ways and practices um, of how to better manage the land. Uh, and in invasive species, there's this battle uh, with the environment, uh, with all these, you know, some of these may look familiar. Does that one, does the, the vine look familiar? Yeah. That one there, yeah, it sticks on you. Yeah, you rub up against it and it grabs your skin pretty good. Uh, this one here, uh, honeysuckle, that one's super amazive. Yeah. Uh, pear tree, dang, you probably know this. Yeah, calorie one. pears. Yeah, so those ones there, they're very invasive. Uh, we got the sterling birds. You got the uh, those uh, um, the carp that that fly up. Yeah, those are very invasive in the rivers. Um, you got these types of praying mantis, not the Carolina praying mantis. Uh, down like in Florida, you hear a lot about the reticulated pythons, a lot of exotic animals that existing down in, in those areas because, um, yeah, and they don't have any predators. Um, but you got to think how these types of things can throw our whole environment out of whack. Okay. And then if there's no basically predator or way of, you know, eliminating these types of invasive species, then um, it puts more havoc on the, the native species trying to fight for space basically too. So we gotta make sure that, that we keep things in check. That's that land stewardship, that relationship we should have. All right, the good stuff, native foods. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have our definitely like our traditional native foods. So I threw some pictures up here. So we have like the three sisters, uh, corn, beans, squash, um, sunflowers. You could say that's like our fourth sister, uh, chinopod or um, kind of relative quinoa wild rice, there's pawpaw. I know a lot of people are more familiar with pawpaw now. It's getting a lot of attention in St. Louis, Missouri. What about this weed? Yeah, that's the other thing. Change your mindset on weeds because like try and tell yourself there's no such thing as weeds. There could be like invasive plants. Yeah, sure. Like, you know, like, but some of these ones here, like these had, these have uses that you can eat the leaves. Uh, you can utilize the flower, the roots, you can make it into a tea. Um, so just trying to, we got to change our mindset sometimes when it comes to some of these plants, even like this one here, pawpaw fruit. Why is it getting all attention all of a sudden, you know, uh, before, cause they call it poor man's banana. Uh, yeah. I mean, it tastes like a kind of like a banana, but yeah, it's these perceptions. And I think that's kind of come in when, you know, the, you know, you think about the beginnings of colonialism and food ways, um, that mindset of, you know, like native people, our foods and way of life was very primitive, savage like and stuff. We and I think that was kind of like that that beginning part of it, right? Um, and now it's like, no, we can utilize a lot more foods in our environment. Um, this one here, I don't know, has anyone seen this plant before? Oh, out the back? 
Yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah, Lance Porter, Goosefoot. Yeah. So this plant produces that seed up there. Um, and like I said, it's it's like uh it's like quinoa. Um you can use the grain. Yeah. But not the leaves or anything else. You can use the leaves actually, you can put that in a salad mix. And actually we have recipe cards over there, and I actually put that as a note in there. So yeah, and honestly, it's just doing research. It's it's I think that's a part of going back to relationship. It's to enhancing your relationship with plants and animals, learning more about it. It's not just all about looks and we know that plants give us oxygen. It's like, you no, know, these plants are here for a purpose. They can provide us food and medicines, um, multiple things. Yeah, obviously we've got different types of all kinds of different wild game. Obviously we got, I took this picture when I was up in uh, Montana. Um, there was one of the tribes up there. They actually had uh, basically their own herd of buffalo. And so you hear like a lot of stories where a lot of the tribes are introducing uh, buffalo back into the wild so yeah th they're fenced off there's a little fence here but um they have a ton of property up there that uh the that the herd can roam around um obviously we got deer elk turkey rabbit i mean all kind and it goes beyond that you know it just keeps on going that's more i think i i put on there like more of the land the land one so i'm thinking more aquatic here so we got waterfowl the interesting thing is is that and in some of these books that you might come across with like dealing with cahokia um, it's interesting. They would have pottery and they would, um, they were so well done that you could tell what specific duck. It wasn't like a random duck species that they kind of created on their pottery. Like they specifically had designs and, you know, even as small as like, you know, the lines and the, and the little eye ring, things like that into their pottery, uh, turtles, um, you know, you got mussels, and it's crazy how big some of these mussels. You go around, like especially like Merrimack and stuff. Like you find those big shells that are like size of your hand. It's like I, I never would have thought of seeing mussel shells that big. Um, different types of aquatic animals uh, or fish, um, and, and, and even some of these things too. Like you know, we talk about how uh, native people like you know they use the all the animal. Like yeah, think about in terms too, like animal plants. Like they have life themselves. So we want to kind of like almost like honor that and say like, hey, like we want to um, we're not just going to just toss you out and stuff and just only use like certain pieces. Like, you know, if I use turtle soup and only use like, you know, just the meat portion, it's like, no, I want to actually I want to see if I can use the shell for something. Some people use it for me for like rattles, ceremonial purposes, um, you know, uh, maybe it goes part with like their traditional wear regalia. Um, same thing with like maybe muscle shells. You might see that with uh, other components with, like I said, traditional wear or um, use of ceremonies and things like that. Yeah, and then there's some medicinal plants too. So you all try sumac. So it's not poison sumac that you're drinking, so no worries. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so this type of sumac, you've probably have seen this all the time, but yeah, you can actually trim the top part off um, and then you can use the, the berries and steep that. Um, some people make that into a lemonade. Um, but yeah, it has more of a tart flavor. Uh, and then there's um, sassafras in that one that right now you can see the leaves are turning like nice yellow, orange, reddish colors. I love that. Um, but um, and usually I'll harvest the root and use that for a, a tea as well. Um, there's eastern red cedar, you know, there's, there's some other species of cedar, but uh, with native folks, it's more so this species of eastern red cedar which I guess they say it's not like a true cedar, but we still consider, that's like, hey, we just say cedar. <laughs> uh, but we'll use that for medicines and ceremonial purposes. Um, why? I cannot I cannot remember the name of this. You probably Jewelry. remember it. Huh? Jewelry. Jewelry, yes. So the interesting thing, I, what I like about this is oftentimes I'll see this right next to poison ivy and you can use that plant to treat poison ivy. Yeah. What about this one? We saw dandelion. We see this one in the in the driveway and the yard all the time, right? Yeah, there's like a broadleaf and narrow leaf plantain plant. So you can utilize those seeds at the top, uh, fibrous material that you can use it kind of like a just extra fiber source. Uh, yeah, see, uh, you can use the leaves. You can you create a pumice out of it. I think people use it for like uh, cuts and burns. Um, so like I said, these plants they have multiple uses. This is spice bush. Sorry, the picture's a little blurry. Uh, but you see the little berries, that one's turning red there. And then these ones are all green, so they're not really ripe yet. But um, yeah, you can see those leaves. Now, these leaves I was mentioning earlier that uh, these ones here, uh, if you're out and about, they kind of remind you of honeysuckle. Um, the way to kind of tell the difference, though, is the leaves, they're kind of on, on uh, spice push, they're kind of offset, whereas honeysuckle, the leaves are 
right across from each other. They're stacked up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, these are more of our sacred medicines that you'll see Native people use. Uh, so we have sage. Uh, so we got white sage up there. Yeah. Now there are different varieties of sage. So, but the ones that we more so use is white sage. Uh, this would be more of your cedar. Yeah. Sweet grass. Um, has anyone read braiding sweet grass? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, sweet grass, we like to think like that's kind of like Mother Earth's hair. And it's really interesting too, because you can literally take your fingers and like go through the, the blades of grass and it feels like you're, yeah, you're combing through hair. Um, and then we have tobacco too. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of these we'll use for like ceremonial purposes, smudging um, to, you know, um, remove bad uh, energy, um, bring us into a good, good, um, good mind, uh, good spirit. Um, also too, like, you know, I'm not saying like all tribes do this too. It may vary, but like uh, tribes may um, uh, utilize tobacco maybe as like a form of like uh, um, offering um, or also maybe communication with the spirit world, uh, things like that. Yeah. But, you know, it, it varies different tribes. Like we kind of have to almost think about too, um, when it comes to cultural practices and knowledge, it can vary tribe to tribe. There's not like all tribes are all the same. Well, you can see some similarities for sure, but specifics, like, you know, you'll see differences. Yeah, oops, yeah. So ceremonial ones, kind of getting the ceremony. So um, uh, a lot of people were here, was here about peyote. Um, so uh, yeah, actually that one's still being utilized uh, to this day. Um, uh, Yopan, you all are drinking Yopan? Yeah, so they uh, found remnants of this in a pottery, a piece of pottery uh, over at Cahokia. And so um, what, the knowledge that was kind of found was that it's related to um, what they call the, the black drink. And so I don't know what the exact concentration is where, but basically, you know, and what that ceremony would be tied to. But basically, large amounts of the Yopan would be drink, drink and um, uh, the people basically purge. So there's some type of like, you know, kind of like cleansing or, you know, kind of like a fasting type of thing that's kind of going on there, you know, um, and that's very typical, I think, with the, like with Native people and, and their and their beliefs, you know, like I was talking to a uh, relative down in um, Zuni and they're talking about how when we harvest um, salt down there, like the salt is very fine, very powdery. It's very interesting. Like, it's not grainy like what we're kind of used to, um, very soft. But prior to them harvesting salt, they have to fast. Um, and it's it, it's multiple days. I think it's like maybe three or four days, something like that. But they have to do that before they have to go and harvest. You know, once again, these things are connected with our spiritual beliefs and respect and relationship with the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cooking methods. Very tribe to tribe. Um, you can see some similarities, maybe in, in certain regions. Uh, you know, you see a lot of times with like, especially a lot of coastal tribes, tribes that utilize a lot of fish, ocean uh, animals. Um, you see like a lot of smoke that go smoking that um, that goes on, uh, earthen pits. Um, you see that especially more so. I I feel like I come across across this with more like archaeological reports. Um, I don't. I haven't really come across like my relatives or anything really utilizing the earth ovens. Um, my wife, now her side, like she's Samoan. Uh, her dad grew up in um, American Samoa, was born in Western Samoa, and obviously you hear a lot, a lot of Polynesians, they do a lot of the ovens, um, the earth ovens. Um, so that's an effective way to cook your, your, um, your foods. Uh, you can have different pits uh, or like smaller pits made for fermentation. Um, I know I've seen like a, a documentary where um, I can't remember if they put it actually in a vessel or if actually it was inserted into, it was on a beach and they dug a hole into the beach in the sand and they let uh, seafood basically kind of ferment down in there. Um, and I can't remember if it was put in a vessel or not or they just allow this, the natural, you know, sand and soil to kind of, you know, do the fermenting for themselves. Uh, well, um, then you have that oven that's right there. So that one you might see more specifically down in the Southwest. So um, I know with the Zuni, we have, we utilize these ovens uh, for bread making a lot. Yeah. And then like with the Choctaw people, a lot of Southeastern tribes will utilize a lot of these big pots uh, here. Um, and that, you know, use them like for different various stews or 
um, especially like uh, with corn, um, you got to think about like, you know, if you dry out corn, okay, and we got to, you know, get that softened back up and get it softened up again and things like that, we're going to utilize these types of cooking methods. Yeah. Uh, think of Native people, like I said, it's so interesting how uh, it's always been thought that Native people have been like, you know, the primitive savage. Uh, don't They don't know anything. But yet, they've been bioengineering food. So think about like corn, this type of corn we know today. Well, it started out like this, but Native people knew that they had that relationship. They had the knowledge in order to cultivate corn into this, you know, bigger variety. And there's multiple varieties. Um, if you think about different colors of corn, right? Um, those different colors are related to how that corn can grow in a certain region. So like you think like blue corn, you always hear about blue corn growing in the Southwest. So yeah, that variety does really well in the, in the Southwest. It may not do so well up in like North by the Great Lakes area, you know? Um, so there, there's a purpose behind all these different types of corns. Um, and this is chinopod. So that lamb's quarter that we talked about earlier, uh, yeah, so you got to think about like, you know, producing like better varieties of flavors of, of foods too. Um, you know, you're, you're, if you're domesticating a plant, you want to make sure like something is going to be tasting better, look, maybe produces bigger seeds or better fruits or things like that. You know, it's like things that we see in the store today. Like, you know, a lot of those foods that we see, like, you know, oftentimes are like double the size or triple the size of what you might find out in the wild. So, um, that yeah, kind of leads into some other stuff we'll talk about. Yeah, and like I said, regional foods. So like up in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, Alaska, you might see utilization of more like things like whale, seal, you know, a lot more of those like aquatic animals. Um, in the Northeast, you'll have like utilization of like corn and variety of ways. Actually, I, I mean, in my opinion, corn is used all over the place. Southwest, uh, um, I was talking about like uh, mutton. Um, so you it, with goat, you're you're taking goat and you make it into like a stew or, um, you know, mm -hmm. using that meat for something else. Uh, in the Southeast, uh, this is Tanchi Labona, um, the Choctaw people make. Uh, so we can take like a, any kind of meat really, but oftentimes we'll use a rabbit. I meant to bring the rabbit stick. Yeah, show you how we hunt with that. Uh, but basically uh, it looks kind of like a small club, stands up probably about that high. Uh, hickory branch kind of about that thick around with a uh, slender handle. And we'll take those those cl small clubs and we'll throw it at the rabbits. And that's that was a hunting method there. Um, the blow guns, that was another hunting weapon there, uh, used for smaller game. Blow guns don't seem like they would be very effective, but oh my gosh, those things are they they will they will fly. I freak my cats out. Like some cats are misbehaving, they're up on places they're not. I'll take my blowgun and freak them out. So um, yeah, those things are no joke. And the one I have, like you'll see, right? The one I have is just kind of like one for kids. It's like this size. There's ones that I mean that were real big. So they're going to pack more power to them. Um, obviously here, like the relationship of bows, arrows, there's also atlatls. Atlatls, I think people don't really think about, but it's kind of like a long arrow, but it launches from an arm. You're throwing this arrow rather than like through a bow. Yeah, but then we also have contemporary native foods. So um, I think a lot of people know, like have seen, heard of uh, like Indian native tacos. Um, but also too, like this isn't like something that's been around forever. Like this is more of a contemporary type food that was actually more of a survival food. Um, so this was something that, you know, during that time of removal and being displaced, the you know, federal government give tribes you know, like things like flour, lard, things like that. So um, basically Native people figured out like, hey, well, let's just combine all these ingredients and let's make fry bread. So fry bread, if you actually look at it, very high in fat, um, simple carbohydrates, not really the greatest nutritional food, but it kept us alive. So I think it's been just, we have that connection to it in that type of way. Um, and there's different ways you can make it, you know, kind of make it more of a taco style. Um, and then there's ones that you can make more dessert, like, Hey, you throw sprinkle some, you know, powdered sugar, or you put some honey or uh, like a grape jam on it, things like that to make it sweet. Um, yeah, actually up here, this was actually, I had this meal, this picture is from a meal I had up at a uh, Chickasaw uh, museum down in Oklahoma. Um, so they had like great dumplings and, um, uh, it was like a corn stew, uh, which was awesome. Yeah. Their, their museum, if you ever get the opportunity, their Folsom museum, 
check it out. It is awesome. Yeah. And we also got to visit uh, First Americans Museum in Oklahoma City. That's another amazing museum to recommend. Uh, Humpfish Gather last year, you know, I talked about we had Chef Nephi Craig. This is Nephi here. Um, there's Sean Sherman at the top, very known, um, you know, contemporary foods. So this is his book. So you can always kind of check out. Now, I will say, though, like his stuff gets uh, kind of a bit fancy at times when you're reading the recipes. So kind of be aware when you're reading through and just kind of, um, you know, if, if it's something you want to try out, it may be hard, difficult to find like uh, ingredients at times. Um, but yeah, but this picture here is a dish that um, uh, Nephi created and I helped him out with creating like that menu draft. So we did like a little three sisters and kind of a um, uh, little grain pasta salad or not salad, but mix. So we had like the quinoa, corn, beans, squash. Um, there's wild rice with the squash. Uh, I think we also had a, a seafood stew. So we had like mussels. We were, we were kind of replicating like the, we didn't get like harvest mussels from the Missouri River and stuff like that just because we're kind of, uh, we don't know what the water quality might be like. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, so we kind of play safe, but we put catfish in there too as well. Um, and then I think, I don't know if I had a cedar tea with that, I forgot what tea variety that was. Um, and then we also had buff, uh, bison in here. And um, I think there's might've been one other protein. Yeah. Yeah. And also think too, like, uh, our, like I said, there's a disruption with our food waste. So that transition of what we had that kind of what appeared to be more wild was then converted into like a lot of the Euro-American agricultural practice. And you saw like a lot of uh, monoculture and, you know, a lot of, um, you know, the Euro, the Euro European animals being brought over and dis domesticated over here. So you had cattle, chickens, things like that. So you got to think about how that can also affect the land. Um, and, and even like, you know, people who aren't used to the, some of these certain types of foods that are being brought over, how that can impact some people's, uh, Native people's health too. Yeah. So as I kind of mentioned, like when it comes to like Native gardening, agricultural practices, you know, it's interesting how, like I mentioned, the, how people are now reflecting on indigenous ways, because you see a lot of like, you know, instead of the monocrop system, the use of like companion uh, plants being used. So if you think about companion plants, three sisters, uh, you have corns being squashed and they all support each other. Um, but also too, think about not, not what's growing on above the surface, but also below the surface. They're exchange, exchanging nutrients um, that's helping out the soil um, in, in their own ways. Um, I don't know all the science chemistry behind it, but I do know that much about it. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned too, you know, what we may think might look like wild um, is actually it's it's not wild. It's being it can be tended to, um, but we know that hey these these plants they just tend to grow well with one another. And we think about that diversity diversity is so much beneficial to the environment than just having like you know one or two plants growing in one spot. You know, and it's not even just for our own benefit, but also think about what other ant plants are going to be coming in here or uh, animals are coming in here. Um, think about the different types of varieties of birds, insects, things like that it's drawn to. Uh, think about the coverage. Like we think about if anyone's a hunter in here, think about the cover that you get for like, you know, deer, turkey, uh, uh, um, what I'm thinking, prairie chickens, things like that. Uh, think of that type of term. Uh, well, I think over, people aren't really seeing that type of picture. Yeah. All right, so um, I mentioned at the beginning that we do have the Hunt Fish Gather event. Um, so that's November 9th. It's a chef demonstration by Chef Brad Dry. He's Cherokee um, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we'll have that St. Louis Zoo at the McDonald Center. Uh, we'll have a registration um, link up on our website. And uh, yeah, you just register on there. Just kind of like what you did for, if any of you did that for this event. Um, and yeah, it's available for the first 100 guests and there'll be kind of like some sampling as it, that we'll do here. So please check that out. And then you can always visit our website um, and that's the address there. Uh, this one here, I uh, create this report that talks about uh, local native history in Missouri, St. Louis. So if you wanna, um, I have a copy of this here. So if you wanna kind of skim through it, you can. And uh, it does provide like different sites of like, you know, you know, state parks or other county parks and things like that, that you could visit that actually have connections to Missouri or uh, uh, Native history. 
Um, and then also too, for, like I mentioned, we talk about landing homes. Does anyone have questions or need help with that? We also provide resources with that as well too. Um, and speaking of resources, you know, I kind of mentioned, you know, Charles Sherman's book, you know, Fritz's book. Um, I also have up here a couple other ones. Um, so this one's Eating the Landscape. So this one just provides some uh, native pers perspectives on uh, foods, uh, connection, relationship with plants, and animals. Okay. Uh, this one here is kind of like a quicker, I'd, I'd say a very thinner version of an ethnobotany dic dictionary. So a little bit more scientific, but talking about like the, the, the different plants, okay, um, that you can use for foods and medicines. Uh, this one here, does anyone live out in Chesterfield? No? Okay. Uh, so Chesterfield is, uh, has a lot of archaeological findings that's connected to Cahokia. Um, so there's a, we call it citizen archaeologist, Mark Leach. Um, he's done a lot of research out there and protection of a couple of sites. Um, him and Joe Harl. Joe Harl is, a, is an archaeologist too, but um, Mark has a book out and it talks about like, um, uh, you know, the research that he's found and what those connections are to Cahokia. So um, I'll have these books up here and you all can, are more welcome to check those out. Um, oh yeah. And we have a couple of them here. So we have the oh, nice. Chesterfield book here. And for check out, we have the sous chef book. I don't think we have the feeding Cahokia one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was kind of excited. I didn't even know. Mark was like, hey, you need to get my book. And I was like, why? And then he just showed me. He's like, because you're in the book. And I'm like, oh, sweet. I'm in a book. And I'll be in there forever. Okay. I was cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Mark has a few books out there that help you out if you ever want to learn more about um, some of that history. But, yeah, thank you so much for coming on out. And then um, we do have food samples. Um we got the different types of tea. Like I said, we got two varieties of yop yopan tea out there. The black drink, just don't drink high quantities to make yeah. yourself uh, sick. Um, I got the spice bush and sumac. And then I do have two different types of bison chilies up here. I want you to try out. And I'm going to ask to see which one you prefer. Okay. All right. Um, Did you make one of them? <laughs> huh? Did you make one of them? I made both of them. Oh, yeah. 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 So I want to, I want to kind of get your thoughts on, on them. So, yeah. Um, does anyone have questions? Uh, in the, in the, um, what's it, a land stewardship, stewardship statement? Uh huh. Do you want to say, you want to, at the end, it said for the next seven generations, what is the significance of that? Yeah. So, seven generations, it's like we think of like, um, when we look at a lot of many different teachings and I'm not saying like all tribes look at this, but I think it's been shared, uh, with a lot of different tribes and kind of like adopted it, but it's looking at like seven generations, like behind us, like what have our ancestors kind of done, uh, seven generations behind us. And, and then also to looking forward, like how do we also kind of plan for the future seven generations ahead of us to make sure that we have this continuous cycle that things are being taken care of in the future. Because indigenous perspectives is very cyclical. Um, if you see like a lot of our teachings, uh, beliefs and stuff, there's a lot of different types of cycles that kind of go on. Um, and that it, it kind of falls in place with that. It's once again, kind of cyclical. Like if we're looking at what the, what's happening in the environment today, what, do, what are things that we need to do right now in order to make sure that things seven generations next are going to be okay yeah so it's kind of like in that type of concept but it can go much deeper than that yeah, yeah. i'm just kind of being very superficial with it yeah yeah uh question yeah so you had a picture of a cactus with the peyote i thought it was yeah. there with mushrooms yeah no uh, it's like a little yeah like a little little cactus it's okay it's not a cactus. peyote mushrooms so that's yeah. what they call them. no yeah. Okay. yeah, maybe it just looks like it. I'm not, yeah. I, I, I don't mess with it. I know like certain posts that, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just curious. Yeah. I've never done it either. So. <laughs> yeah, I hear about it from my friends. Yeah, yeah. You know, certain tribes that utilize it. Um, there's also the Native American church, which is kind of like a blend. That, yeah, um, they'll utilize that as well, too. But, you know, that it's not like something that, that it's just used only for like achieving like a high or, you know, it's it goes beyond that reaching. You're trying to reach a certain okay. spiritual level and get connection. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing when it comes to, I think, that the, 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 that the knowledge that goes behind that. How did, how did our people go to, you know, 
basically get to know these plants in a way that, hey, like you can only have so much of this certain plant to achieve something like, you know, you, kind of like a doctor prescribing a medicine almost. It's it's in that type of context of like that knowledge is all there, uh, which is, I think it's very significant. And um, yeah, it's unfortunate that things have been affected that, you know, we're trying to regain a lot of that knowledge and, you know, bring it back out and reutilize it because like I said, all everything that's happened ever since colonialism, it's just kind of thrown our whole way of life off. I think corn came from Peru, right? The what? Corn came from Peru. Yeah, like Mesoamerica yeah, area, yeah, Central America area. Yeah, and it kind of yeah, it's yeah. kind of been shared. Um, the thing is, though, too, is that you will also hear our, our stories associated with it. Like, you know, someone has uh, gifted uh, corn seeds or something and maybe uh, told someone that you need to plant this, you know, too. So that's where it's very interesting of blending our, our stories in with the actual science with it. And they can kind of they can kind of intertwine with each other, too. And that's what's um, kind of being told here, like with things like you, you find like Cahokia or um and different site ar archaeological findings. Um, I always like to bring up too with uh, what we're taught in school about Native people aren't from this land. Well, there's no archaeological findings saying that we're from Asia or anything, but it's interesting that how those theories are so ingrained into our books and uh, education system that now that's what people believe that we're from Asia. Like in and it's always interesting to like how uh, archaeologists or uh, Western scholars they always want to prove that native people aren't from this land, but there's no science behind to back it up, and they oftentimes refuse to listen to our stories, which many of these people have been here for hundreds and thousands of years. Yeah, and some folks, you know, and I think that kind of goes with time. It's that you know some of that knowledge can can it can be lost because you know you have groups of people that may have maybe disbanded and they join like other tribes and maybe that cultural knowledge there was maybe transferred into those tribes and blended so things can happen so um to groups of people like they always said what happens to the people at Cahokia well it's not like they went like you know just everyone like died and like or anything it's just like no like you know a lot of people think about like kind of like energy like you know people do the same thing like things get just kind of transferred out dispersed and stuff and blended in uh with other people and practices and beliefs and stuff so yeah yeah, yeah. um if you kind of give me like a general idea of what you think what your opinion is on like um what do like north american native people think or feel is there like a connection with the south american mm -hmm. uh, and central american native people as well because like all my life growing up i've always felt sure. like um it's like for example i went to like a Cahokia art fair or something yeah. and somebody asked me what nation are you yeah and my family's from peru yeah. and uh, i said oh i said my family's from peru they said oh okay kind of like you're not you know and, and i felt like yeah you know, I am a native person. Yeah, exactly, person. exactly, yeah. And so I kind of feel like there's always been a disconnect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's the other part of like kind of decolonize our minds with, uh, we've got to start removing like our, what our perceptions are with these borders. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. like you got to think before colonization, like native people were just all from as far north as Alaska all the way down to Argentina. So, um, and you know, yeah, you might see the differences with, you know, like I said, different cultural practices and a way of life and stuff. But essentially like, you know, we're all, you know, relatives, yeah. you know, so we just say, you know, if you're, you know, that you're a Southern sister basically. So <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And, and today too, like, I think it's, a, it can be a hardship. I think from speaking to, you know, some folks that the like, people I've like maybe worked with or just talked to maybe who are like from Mexico and stuff, it's like, you know, I think we oftentimes, I think it's said that that hardship of like, you know, remembering or make having space in for the indigenous people who are like in Mexico or, you know, south of that um, and, and other countries, because it's like it's so ingrained with like the Hispanic culture and stuff. Um, and I know that like they've mentioned too, like there's like conflict um, between the kind of like the, you know, the two different cultures mm -hmm. there too. So um, but I think we need to just kind of remember like, hey, there are indigenous people down like south of us and north of us, and they're, we're all re kind of related in, in a certain way. Yeah. Well, I know the Peruvians have a 
a thing where where the eagle fly with the condor. Yeah. Uh, that mm -hmm. the North American Native Americans will wake up and they can go and rest because they're holding the medicine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I forgot to mention too, actually Yopan. So um I think about too like uh they're kind of thinking about like all those relatives there would have been like a lot of trading and networking kind of going on you know we, you kind of so mentioned about it with like you know corn yeah um yopan was the same thing yopan only grows in the south it's a holly plant it grows down in the southeast portion of the united states um but they're finding it in different sites mm -hmm. all across so um you're seeing that like uh, you know Native people have been trained it's not like things have been very localized or staying in one region like things are being shared and um in that regard yeah. Yeah. yeah awesome well yeah well i guess a little that let's try out some foods yeah let me get your opinion um we got the oh yeah yeah sorry actually uh yeah we're going to i'm going to demo i totally forgot about that yeah i want to demo like a little salad so i did kind of keep things really um basic uh because i wanted to make sure like i, I wasn't pulling like a sean sherman getting real fancy with things um so we have the recipe cards uh over there but i kind of made things where you can kind of piece things together uh relative relatively quick so like the chili over here you know i use like um you know if i had more time i didn't because i was busy this weekend so but i really like buy some chili so i was like well i'll utilize like canned beans um you know canned tomatoes things like that um and you know obviously that's a lot quicker process than actually trying to you know cook up the beans and everything um okay so i'm going to create like a little three sister salad what's something that you can kind of do at home so items that you'll need uh you can use any kind of greens i did throw in the recipe card you can throw in like the dandelion greens the uh, goosefoot lamb's quarter greens um over here we got obviously squash corn uh you can whether it's fresh corn or you, you use canned corn like i said it depends on your life you know if you're busy on the go i get something quick uh butternut squash um same thing there you can use it fresh i've seen butternut squash and i've each I, i've bought frozen butternut squash you just throw it in the microwave um thing is so you want to get it chilled down um zucchini okay got that other type of squash there and then we got a couple of different varieties of beans here okay so if we think about uh, macro, my, macro, micronutrients, oh, and then quinoa, and this is like a blend of quinoa, uh, so you'll see different colors in there. All these, even though uh, these are all plants, these are not, these are only going to give us non-essential amino acids or proteins, um, so whereas like animal proteins, they're essential, or they're going to give us essential amino acids, they, they give us all the proteins and amino acids that our body needs. With plants, though, you got to get a mixture of stuff. So that's kind of like a hardship if anyone's, you know, obviously if anyone's vegan or vegetarian in the room, you kind of know about that. But those who don't, um, you, if uh, if you're only eating plants, you got to eat a whole variety of plants in order you get all the macro uh, micronutrients in your body to support you. Okay, so what we're going to do here, and we got a dressing here now you can obviously make your own dressing but uh this is uh sunflower oil based dressing yeah so as i mentioned some sunflowers are native to uh to the america so we're going to utilize that okay. pull this out so all you gotta do really easy you know grab yourself some greens then we can see that okay <laughs> i gotta make sure what i'm doing here this is my first demo, so I I actually messaged Nephi and I'm like Nephi, I'm I'm you better watch out, man. I'll give you some competition. <laughs> okay, so we got some of that. We can throw some beans in there. Actually, I'm gonna throw some quinoa first. Now, so you can do whatever you like. And everything is, you know, I know recipes. They always say. You know specific measurements and stuff but honestly like with those recipe cards you you do you you have you know your taste buds what you like some people they might like spicier stuff so adding like jalapenos or peppers or things like that to it you know you can always do that so we're gonna throw some beans in here
-hmm. And that's the other thing too. Think about like all the different colors that are going into this. Uh, that's what you want. So we're looking like that so far. See those different colors. I'll make some two. I'll make sashes, and we're all going to be able to taste test this. Yeah, uh, we'll do a little. What was that last vegetable you put in there? Uh, zucchini. Oh. Yeah. Did you cook the zucchini? Uh, Mel did, actually. She, yeah. <laughs> I had to take care of that. Yeah. Like I said, I was real busy, uh, you know, doing this yesterday. So, you know, like that stuff, I, like I went to a Renaissance Festival. I went to a concert last night. So I didn't get around to cooking that stuff until like midnight. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like sometimes if you look at, you know, we get, we got busy lives. We're all doing stuff. So. That's why, like, you know, I, like I said, I utilize the canned beans, corn, you know, things like that in there versus like getting it like fresh. Okay. Whereas like this Mel, had, you know, she took, had the time, you know, a little time frame, and she it was, she was able to incorporate more of the fresh foods in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And then we'll just take this and we'll all have to see how this dressing is because I've never used this dressing. So. <laughs> I guess I'm gonna have to hit the weights. Yeah. Yeah, and the gloves are gonna. That is the bottom. The other side of the. Yeah. Here, let me get some of this wrapper off too. See if that helps out. There we go. Oh, come on now. <laughs> ah, that, that was a lot easier, yeah. All right. That was a moment. Really sound? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we just mix that all up. Okay. All right. So we can always try this out and then make changes to it. Yeah. So we're gonna share it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, questions. Oh, that was just like extra tease. Yeah. So actually, um, this is like what I do with the spice bush is that um, a lot of the plants, if it's uh, like hanging off twigs or something like that. Um, so I'll tie them up like this and then I'll hang them up high and uh, let them dry out and stuff. And obviously, you know, I rinse them off beforehand and everything. That's why I kind of hang them in this format. Um, but also too, I know like a lot of, a lot of folks so when it comes to teas, like they'll have it down here. So that way all the like, you know, that flavor and stuff kind of still stays retained within the leaves and the twigs and stuff. So. Yeah, so there's that. And then inside or outside? Huh? Do you hang it inside or outside? I hang it inside. Okay. Yeah. Just so that way I get any extra bugs hiding in there. Yeah. So yeah. Because I did see when I was rinsing off, and that's the reason why you want to rinse off or you know, have that time to dry off and stuff, is because I caught like a you know, a couple of little small spiders kind of hide in there, but you know, you're all good. Um and then this would be like your sumac. Yeah. So the sumac I harvested from Washu's campus, and then this here was harvested from a park up in North County. So, like I said, spice bush does grow all over places. You just have to kind of get out there and you know spot, you know, keep an eye on it. And you know, I think it, I always like to go out to those. Everyone has like a favorite hiking spot and stuff. So while you're out there, you know, see see what you come across. See if there's anything like edibles or teas, things like that. Um, right now, you got persimmon. I think pawpaw seed is basically over with. Um, persimmon's coming out. Um, but also do you go back out consistently on your hikes, your walks or whatever, and get to know those plants and stuff, you know, develop that relationship because, you know, um, you know, this past year, this past summer I went out there 
And I noticed that like, you know, they were doing more trimming and cutting um, within the park I was at. So, um, and I kind of noticed one area got hit a bit harder and I could tell like it wasn't, the leaves weren't as like nice and full basically. Um, so yeah, it's just like, you know, like I said, it's, and it, you know, it, you keep an eye you on, on those things and, and you have that relationship and it, it kind of, you'll have that sense of care for, for the plants and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm a little hungry. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got here late, of course. Yeah. And I have a question in case you, you if you've already answered it, uh -huh. then we can talk later. Uh -huh. uh, did you share how to prepare sumac tea from the berries of the harvest? Yeah. So um, we what we did is, and I did this at the Hunt Fish Gatherers, that all we did was just put wrap it up in like a cheesecloth. And then we just steep it. Now I know there's like other ways that folks can kind of do it. Like some folks will actually remove all the berries off and do that way. But um, yeah, I think there's multiple ways of kind of handle this. Like even like spice bush. Um, I don't usually just keep it like in that and throw it in somewhere to steep it. Like I'll cut the uh, twigs off, um, and uh, you can make bundles with the twigs, and then um, or put the leaves inside like a you know leaf tea, uh, a tea bag type thing. So. I think there's there's just multiple ways of kind of handling it and stuff. So what are ways that you have you have you? Uh, I was just gifted with some today. Uh -huh. And the understanding that I get from Sandy is you can also just simmer it, never boil. Oh yes, yes. Simmer it in water and yes. just you know straight it out. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like with yeah, I would say specifically too. Yeah, with something like that, it's not like you're letting it sit in boiling water. It's like you can get your water to a boiling temp. And then from there, you just reduce it down and then you let it just basically steep in there. And obviously, the longer time that you let it steep, it's going to draw more flavor out. Yeah. And they're better sumacs. So, I mean, they're different species of sumac. Yeah. So there's like staghorn, smooth. Yeah. The ones I've harvested have been smooth. The smooth. Yeah. Sumac. Yeah. Yeah. I've tried the, the staghorn, but the it's just, a, I don't know. It's, it, I just didn't get the, the, yeah, yeah. Well, and then also too, like there, there's more. It looked like the, there's more hairs and things like that yeah, on it. And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and so, I have not messed with like I did take like one comb, but I was just like, and I was like, I I didn't mess with it. So yeah, I couldn't tell you what flavors like. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's well, sample them. Yeah, let me. Uh, here's one batch of salad, and if we need, you need like more dressing. 